Um, well, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to adjust my screen appropriately uh, as folks kind of slowly load in. I want to welcome everyone to another edition of Reader Meet Writer. Uh, I am your host. My name is Wiley Cash. I am the author of When Ghosts Come Home that came out uh, just a few months ago on September 21st. You can buy it wherever books are sold. And this program, Reader Meet Writer, is brought to you by SEBA. SEBA stands for the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance. And this is an organization that represents just under 700 independently owned bookstores throughout the Southeast. And maybe one of those bookstores is how you know about the book that we will be discussing tonight. So if something that you hear tonight uh, piques your interest, please purchase the book from the bookstore that brought you to tonight's event. Um, normally, uh, an event like this would take place at a bookstore. And COVID has made that a little more challenging, a little bit less challenging than perhaps it was last year at this time, but a little more challenging than it was two years ago. So Reader Meet Writer has been bringing you these events since the early days of the pandemic. We were one of the early Zoom games in town, and we have gotten a lot of support from readers and bookstores. So thank you so much, and I hope it continues. Uh, our guest this week is Jared W. Alexander. Uh, he'll be discussing... Um, his new novel, uh, his new memoir, uh, Volunteers. And if you have a question tonight for Jared about anything you've heard about his book or about writing or about war or about politics or about coming of age or masculinity or any of the, 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 the subjects that we'll be discussing tonight, and there's a lot to discuss in this book, um, make sure you go down to the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen and type in your name and the name of your home independent bookstore whenever you ask your question. And if you have one, I'll ask Jared your question at the end of the show. It will not interrupt us. If you do that while we are talking, I won't even know until the very end. So please do that. Writers love questions. But without further ado, I want to introduce tonight's guest. Jared W. Alexander has written for Esquire. He's written for Rolling Stone, The Nation, Narratively, and elsewhere. He holds an MFA in Literary Reportage from the New York University Arthur L. Carter School of Journalism. From 1998 to 2006, he served as a U.S. Marine deploying to the Mediterranean, East Africa, and Iraq. He grew up on military bases from the East Coast of the United States to Japan. He currently lives in New York City, but like a Southerner, any good Southerner, he calls Atlanta home. He can't get it out of his system, I suppose. Um, Jared, thank you so much for joining us, man. I really appreciate this. Oh, thanks for having me here. This is, this is great. Appreciate it. And thank you uh, for writing this really beautiful book. And, you know, I have, I have quite a few friends who have written, you know, fiction about contemporary wars. Uh, you know, I'm 44. I imagine you and I are about the same age. Um, there's been a lot of stuff written about war, uh, nonfiction and from embedded reportage, uh, short stories. This, your book feels really deeply personal and really fresh to me. And I want to talk about that a little later on, but I want to talk about the story that opens the book, the story about capture the flag. Um, and how you kind of frame that story as the jumping off point of the forever war. And before you tell the story, if you'll indulge, me, indulge us and tell that story, in the margins, at the end of that story, um, I hope this isn't an overstep to share this with you, but I wrote, I wrote war regardless. Um, so can you share that story with us and, and why you chose to open with that? I think it encapsulated a lot of things for me in one, one very, very small, tight package. Um, so to, to, to give some context, um, I, you know, I was, I was in the Civil Air Patrol and I was living in Japan and I was getting toward the end of my parents' tour there. And I was at this little encampment they would hold every year. And part of that, would, they took us out to this, this set of woods to play capture the flag. There's a field in the sort of in the middle of these trees. And one of the, one of the instructors ha had initially given me a, a, what is a ghillie suit, which is a, and he gave me the hat, which has a lot of burlap on it. And it sort of conceals you and it's meant for use in, uh, with snipers. 
and uh, you know, surveillance target acquisition Marines. And he had been in the Army infantry before he transitioned to, into the Air Force. So when he gave me that in hand, he handed me these little uh, camouflage sticks and I painted my face as best I could. And it was like, uh, it was, I was sort of transforming into this idea of a soldier that I had in my mind to a, to a degree. Now I had played war in those woods. I knew those woods really well. I'd been there, you know, been in, in and out of those woods off and on those three years. And so I knew the trails that ran around the, 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 the skirt of the field that we were playing on, but nobody else really did. And so I took advantage of that and I ran down this trail in, in this sort of dense woods. It was in the summer of 95 and uh, came around the backside and sort of slow crawled like a soldier would, you know, as if under machine gun fire to this objective. And I grabbed their flag and I could see the players ahead of me, but I could see their backs to me and then low crawled back away and, and came out, you know, crawled back into the woods and my, you know, a blood was rushing and there was a lot of adrenaline in it. And then I got to the trail and I stood up and I ran for it. You know, I ran down the length of that trail back toward my side, back to my team. And uh, weirdly enough, and this is going to sound like a terrible cliche, but I had fortunate sun kind of in my head a little bit. I, I, I initially had that in the draft. Um, and it was, I feel like such a, a, such a kid for saying that, but these are songs that I was listening to at the time because of my interests. And, you know, I, everything in that run I sprinted and everything in that, in that, in that dash back sort of, I had won, I, I, I had done the job and I was, I was coming home as a victor effectively. And everything about what I wanted for my future was encapsulated into that, into that sort of, you know, that complex web of, of imagery and music and, and physical action and, and primal adrenaline. And so I, and it was also signaling what I wanted for myself uh, from my from my early adulthood and so i think that's why i picked it it sort of it sort of grabbed everything and put it into one seamless motion and it set the stage for what i wanted for myself and i was hoping to with, with the reader sort of show like look this is where we're going and here's how i'm starting it or at least in the midpoint but here's kind of where i'm at before i even get there my head you know to quote kramer in my head i'm already gone you know i was sort of sort of in that space well before um, well before I actually did it. And I wanted to show that. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the book itself? Like um, what the book is, what it is an account of. It's, it, it's in some ways a braided narrative, your time, um, you know, in the service, uh, your time leading up to the service. So can you tell us a little bit about the book itself? Maybe your, your quick pitch or your elevator pitch or whatever you want to share about it. Sure. So an, uh, war stories have a tendency to be about war. And about being in on a battlefield and, and, and exchanging fire with enemy forces or, or the, the emotional experience of being in war. Well, excuse me, I, I wanted to look at what it was like to what, what, what it took to get me there. We have a tendency to sort of we just drop the individual into a combat zone. And that's the story that we discuss or we tend to tell. We don't do a lot of work on the formation of that. Like we're living in a, in, a, in a period in history where our military is entirely, uh, it's not oblig uh, obligatory. You, you, you volunteer for this work. You, you enlist on your own free will. And if you want to go into combat arms, that is a personal choice. Um, and it was for me. And so I wanted to kind of explore that a little bit and try to understand what is it about war that was so attractive to me in the moment? And what propelled me to want to sort of chase that as a goal for myself, not in any, not in any meaner, meaner or, or, or uh, you know, barbaric sense, but just as a, just as a thing to experience. Um, I wanted to sort of explore that from, from a child's eyes and then build into the Marine and, and kind of demonstrate how that happens. And I don't know that I have read, especially a contemporary, you know, narrative about about these more contemporary wars from that standpoint what what made you decide to to take to take that you know narrative structure or that kind of vantage point in the book you know i i think the the structure of the book was probably the biggest challenge you know when i initially wrote it i wrote it in, in strictly linear fashion you know from you know from start to finish and but i found that the war itself was becoming an appendage of hanging on the end of the book it was obvious that I was going to end up there. Um, so I wanted to figure out a more, you know, lack of a better term, artful way of, of blending that into the story. And so 
how do we tend to view war? We, we, we tend to look at it somewhat, you know, it, it's often the distance in a way, you know, especially in our mm-hmm. culture, it's, it's very much removed. It's, we get flashes of it on, in, in, in documentaries or news broadcasts. It's, it's very quick and fast and lacks context to a lot of degree. And so I wanted to play with that a little bit. And so I took the war out of the end. I, I, I just deleted it off the back of the book and, and I started weaving it through the narrative mm-hmm. and, and, to try to find some inner and also to try to find some interplay between what I was talking about in the major sections of childhood or being a teenager or young adult and try to find some kind of connection between the war and those experiences. Um, Because there's a lot of unraveling that's going on in the war. Like I, you know, at at one point I talk about my interest in in generals and commanding officers of history. And then I see one and I see the the, the weight of his burden to a degree, Mm -hmm. the casualty of a Marine. And, and, you know, and I, I realized just how, for me personally, it, it's still something of an interest, but at the same time, it, we don't talk about the cost of that and what that looks like to carry that. And mm-hmm. I wanted to show that, and I wanted to show that in contrast to what I was experiencing as a kid. I hope that answers your question, but my, my objective there was to try to find contrast between those two points. And you're talking, I think in that, in that mention there, you're talking about Rebel Six. Yes. Okay, I wanna talk about that a little bit later, but yeah, that was, that was, some, that was an incredibly, heavy moment and an incredibly heady realization that, that, that you were having looking at this man and, and, and kind of what, what had happened. Um, can you talk about your early years with your mom and Alan um, and the ways in which you perceived, I think masculinity is the right word or maybe manhood, but the way you perceived it through Alan as a father figure, you know, he drives a motorcycle, and then, you know, kind of some of the films that you watched when you were very young and, and kind of how maybe those were prepping you for what was to come. Right. You know, Alan was, was and is a very righteous individual to a large degree. I, I, I guess he has a moral foundation that's, that's really strong. And I saw that even as a kid, he, 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 he was somebody to aspire to. And, you know, we have a very close relationship even to this day um, on that on that premise, I think, to a large degree. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so he gave me a good example, I think, to a lot, uh, um, in, in a lot of ways. What was sort of interesting, though, was he never, in comparison to the films and the, and, and the television shows I was watching at the time, he espoused some of the, the sort of tough guy attitudes, but it was it was very subtle. You know, it was very it was very stiff upper lip, very quiet. He was an emotional individual and couldn't certainly could be, but he was, you know, also, he also has some emotional intelligence about himself. Um, the films and tell the films were sort of an extension of that to a large degree, but without the violence um, or in, in, in his context, not necessarily the mm-hmm. films, but um, you know, I, 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 he would bring home videos like uh, Iron Maiden or Top Gun. And, you know, I, I have kind of a joking rule in my house that, if predators on we watch that you know like because it's such an absurd film but it was also sort of part of my childhood and, sure. and you know robocop is another example of that to a degree you know man you are you are speaking my language <laughs> I, I am with you i am with you yeah i mean those are those are big films from my from my childhood we watched terminator considerably sure um, yeah yeah that was a big one um and then you know a lot of star trek you know and, mm-hmm. and that's where i get my uh that's where i get my foundation that's from my from alan um yeah. So, but, you know, I think that the, the, the films really were the big, those are the shove. I mean, that's the gasoline. That's the octane mm-hmm. in my, in my, in my, in the dreams that I ended up having, you know, um, you know, being maverick is a, is a, is a attractive thing to want to be as a kid. Yeah. Um, you know, so is, uh, you know, so is a lot of those, a lot of those characters, John McClane, Die Hard. you know. Oh you man. Know, yeah. You know of course. I mean? Yeah. Like that's, that's a, that's a heavy, that's a heavy shadow, you know, uh, and it's a very, very attractive one. You know, Indiana Jones is another great example of that. Um, those are ones that were hugely influential to me. Han Solo, I mean, yeah, same, same kind of deal. I was very much interested in the sort of, you know, smart mouth, tough guy who gets hurt, you know, sure. who can be hurt. And I always appreciated that, uh, probably more so than, uh, say, a, you know, like a, a superhero. Um, but those films had a lot to do with, with, you know, my sort of early ideations of what a man was supposed to be and, and how to, how to be a soldier. Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, there was this other layer, you know, that, you know, I, I saw platoon when it came out, you know, I, I watched that. My, 
my parent, my, my Alan brought it home on VHS. I remember the night we watched it, you know, we shut all the lights off in the living room and I sat in front of the TV and watched that film. Um, you know, and, and I, and I saw Hamburger Hill very similar, similarly. And those were sort of like those, those films planted a seed that eventually grew into something later, but you know, the, the film and television right up front were, were, were heavy in my, you know, how I, how I sort of came into the idea of being a Marine or a soldier in general terms. Um, another, another thing that, that was really remarkable about your portrayal of Alan is, you know, and I teach, I, I tell my students this when, when we, um, when we read, we're always asking questions and we're trying to frame whatever we're reading and put it into some kind of neat tradition of what we've already read. And so when I start reading about Alan, I'm like, oh, this is going to turn. This is going to turn bad. Alan's going to do something or they're going to. And it never it never happens. And there's a scene um, where your, your mother's overseas or your mother's at training. I can't remember. She's she's somewhere. And he has this like almost primal scream, right? And you just know it catches you off guard and it scares you, but like the depth to which he misses her is apparent to you. Mm -hmm. And later you write beautifully about military spouses. Um, and not long after that, and maybe soon after that, you write about the idea of the military always being there which and it's tugging people one way or another. Can you talk a little bit about that feeling of being tugged away from people and then having people tugged away from you? You know, when that, when, when Alan um, went through that, that was, I would say probably 85. And my, my mother was in the reserves at the time and got called away. That was the first indication I had ever had that this job could do that. And it was for a very short amount of time, but the real, the real, aside from that, at the time, the Air Force didn't really deploy terribly often. It, it had a, its system was such that you, sp you could spend a lot of time on a, on a single base, mm -hmm. but it wasn't until the Persian Gulf War that that, that changed the dynamic entirely. I mean, it, 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 now my stepdad was in a position of having to go for eight, nine months and he did. And that was a you know, a paradigm shift to use, use the term, but it was, it was far more emotional. You know, it was, you know, the, the, the rug gets pulled out from under you in that context because it was so sudden, you know, we were sort of living our lives in the summer of 1990. And then the next thing I know he's packing it back and then he's out the door and he's gone until the following spring. Um, you know, that, and that was, a, and he's in a, in a war. I mean, he's, he's in a defensive operation and then eventually an armed conflict. And, that was a little jarring from then on it was nothing but deployments it was it was you know he deployed to retrain into a new field and then once he had done that it was three months in the middle east or in the balkans or in support of the balkan efforts later on when those start and uh it was co constant you know it was mm -hmm. it was probably three months out of the year he was he was gone every single year you know and Early on, we were sort of living on, uh, we, were, we were living a very, you know, Pollyanna lifestyle, I think, to that regard. But that was removed, P Persian Gulf War on. It was, that mm -hmm. was no longer existed. But I always understood, though, that the American military lived broader, in a broader sense than the average American did. You know, the military bases are outposts of America, effectively. And you know, in a lot of a certain respect, I think they're even clear, they're classified as, as you know, you know, um, they're not U.S. soil by, by that right. But, you know, you, you are an American citizen and you're born on those bases, you know. Um, and, you know, I met I met service members, kids of service members who had never been to the United States other than to visit. They mm -hmm. were born in one military base in Germany and then moved to Turkey and then moved to Greece and then to Asia somewhere. And they just kind of lived this very, you know, Chaucerian life, effectively, just kind of going from one station to another. Um, you know, uh, it's probably something Orwell would recognize to a large degree, mm -hmm. um, or maybe Conrad, you know. Um, and that was, you know, that was something that was very, very present. Um, I didn't have the fortune of living a life like that, or perhaps misfortune, but 
um, it was definitely in the air. You know, yeah. people came and went and you saw, it was like every year, you know, you, you, you were kind of shaking the class up to see who was coming back and who wasn't. Mm-hmm. You know, you'd break for summer, you'd have your friends typically, but when you came back, there might be some new faces. And those faces yeah. were probably going to be military kids. Well, I'm also thinking, hearing you describe those people moving around, I know they're being moved. You know, they're you know they're kind of chess pieces, global chess pieces in the in the, in the armed forces, armed services. Um, but can we talk about your dad a little bit, um, your birth father, and and his moving around, and the way he saw his life, you know, how, how he thought about Denver, you know, Denver is going to be the place where it all works out or, and, and that trip that you have to go out to visit him, where you, you know, Disneyland and all of that. Can you talk about just that and maybe how that affected your view of what you would go on to do in the service? I don't know if there's much of a corollary to be made between those two, but I would say that my father was a victim of uh, my father was definitely it was well was absolutely a victim of abandonment by virtue of the military, or at least in part. My grandfather, on him, my dad's father, you know, just kind of abandoned my dad and his two brothers. And his, his he was in the army at the time, um, out of Fort Sill, and he just kind of packed up and went to Germany. And he did not maintain a, a very close or all that great relationship with his three sons. He just kind of. He remarried and you know, had new kids and set up a new family and that was his life. Um, and so I think my father uh, was always sort of chasing a kind of a sort of emotional brass ring in that way. Mm. Um, I think that he was, he was, he, he had high demands for himself. You know, he wanted certain things for, of his life and he was sort of clumsily, figuring out what those were and how to get them even at the sometimes quite frankly at the expense of things that were right in front of him i think Mm -hmm. that he he had a tendency to not stop and look around him Mm -hmm. um and you know that's that 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 was one of his flaws and you know it's something that i have to analyze in myself too am i do i you know exhibit those traits and 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 where do i do that i i have a tendency to be very hard on myself you know what's something that's people have pointed out to me is is you know, I'm very, very, I have high demands for myself too. And I have to, I wonder if there's an extension of that between the two of us. And if that's not from the, maybe perhaps the same, or, you know, if it's, if it's from the same source or if there's something maybe a little different about those things. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that my, 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 my dad was proud of my Marine service. Um, I know that he would rather have seen me in the Air Force, <laughs> quite yeah. frankly. I was going to ask about that. Uh, but I know that, I know that, you know, he was, you know, yeah, he was, he was especially proud that I had done that work. Well, can we talk about that? You know, can we talk very quickly? You mentioned uh, your, your, your dad's time in the association with the Air Force. Um, can we talk about your, your, your parents' history, military history, and then their reactions when you enlisted? Yeah, you know, my, my mom and stepdad, you know, they would have been happy to see me in the Marine Corps, or I'm sorry, the Air Force. Um, but they were very, very comfortable with my choice. Um, but they my, my mother's father and stepfather were both air force. Um, her mother's, uh, lineage goes in the British army. You know, um, my stepdad's father was in the air force in world war II. He's in the army air corps and then goes on to the air force in Vietnam later. And then, um, my, uh, maternal grandfather's family was military to a large extent. Um, of course, my grandfather, my dad's side's army. And I eventually learned that, you know, that, that side of the family is deep in, in American military lineage. Um, I didn't know much about that as a, as a, as a kid. I didn't know anything about that as a kid, quite frankly, or even for most of my adulthood, I only learned it in the process of writing about it. And even then I'm, 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 I'm you know, I'd like to see if, maybe if it goes further, but, um, yeah, I mean, my, the, 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 my family can run a hard line all the way back to the revolution in terms of military service in one degree or another, whether we're estranged or not, it, it, it does exist. Um, but no, you know, when I, my decision to join the Marines um, comes out of my own interests and I, I, it was, it evolved from the air force into more, a, a more, a, a dirtier field, a grittier field, uh, 
something a little more like Platoon, quite frankly. I kind of had an interest in being Chris Taylor. Um, that was something that motivated me. And my mother and stepfather understood that. I made no, I made no uh, mystery of that as a teenager. Mm -hmm. And so they were very accepting of the Marine Corps. In fact, my mother said, of all the services, I would rather you've done that than, than say, the Army. I think that, mm -hmm. that was, I, I indicate that. Um, my dad, however, was not, not really that thrilled about the Marine Corps. He, he, was, he was upset about it. Uh, I think he was, his attitude was, why, why, if you're going to go in the military, why work harder? And uh, it's, it's tough enough in certain respects. Why add to your misery? Um, in fact, he tried to, uh, he, tried to inter he introduced me to a, an air traffic controller he worked with who had been a Marine. And that backfired. That just <laughs> didn't work at all for me. He was his intention was to get to scare me off. Yeah. Uh, but that just that didn't work at all. It was it was it didn't do anything for him. And uh, you know he came to accept it. You know he had no real choice in the matter. You know once I was eighteen, I was free to enlist on, on my own terms and did so. Um, but yeah, you know that, that I think his attitude was somewhat tribal in that respect too. You know, the Air Force is a is as a stereotype or perhaps the the reputation of just being smarter you know mm -hmm. it treats its people better you know it's 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 a standard of living is a lot higher and i can i can i can attest to that having been on those bases it's 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 nice yeah you know, they, 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 they do well for their for their service members um but that just that wasn't something i that really interests me i i, I wanted to really get down into the i wanted a foxhole you know i, I you know i want i wanted to be out there in, in the field that was way more interesting to me than having a nice barracks room. <laughs> um, you mentioned this, this story a little bit earlier. Can you talk about um, wanting to be someone like Rebel Six and maybe tell that story um, and then the reality of being someone like him, the responsibility of being someone like him? Sure, I, you know, when I was in, in high school, it was toward the latter half, my junior and senior years of high school, I got really involved in like the junior reserve officer training corps program. And it was run by a, a West Point officer, a retired West Point infantry officer, whose father was on, it landed on, uh, I believe on Utah Beach on, on D-Day, or no, I'm sorry, it was on Hot Beach, on D-Day. And um, so, you know, and he had two kids who were at West Point, or one, he had one kid at West Point, one about to go. Um, and so he had a lot of, he was very steeped in that. And I, he, I was also really interested in it. I, I read a lot of the history of like, you know, Civil War Union generals like Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain or, or you know, George Gordon Meade or, or Winfield Scott Hancock. And, and I was really for Grant. I, I am a huge Grant acolyte, even to this day. I think he's an incredible, incredible uh, historical figure in a, a, large, a, a large, large degree. And I, I thought it would be interesting to go down that road, you know, to, to, to get a commission as an infantry officer in the army and, and, you know, sort of pursue that lineage, but I just didn't have the, I didn't have the, the academic um, self-confidence, you know, I, I don't think I had the, 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 the personality. I felt like another four years of school would have been crippling. Yeah. You know? And I, I wasn't too confident I was going to be able to afford it. Um, or, you know, I, I kind of not done that great my first two years of high school. And I did really well the last two years, but I didn't, I just didn't have the belief that I was qualified and I, I probably lacked some social confidence too in that regard. And so I think it would have been a struggle for me uh, to just go right from high school into college and then become a Lieutenant. I think it would have been better for me to get a commission after I'd done some other things or done some time in the military, then gone to college and then, then become an officer. But by the point, by the time I, I thought to do that. And there was a period in my early thirties where I considered it. Uh, I was already sort of done with the military. I had seen what I wanted to see of it. And, and part of what I saw was, was, you know, guys, you know, Marines like rebel six, you know, I had the fortune of working with some really good Marine officers and he was one of them. Um, he's definitely a stereotype to a degree. You know, he fits that sort of, you know, tough Marine, you know, sort of veneer, you know, you know you know, to a degree, we kind of need those people, even if we don't like yeah. them much. And, uh, but he was also incredibly intelligent and, and incredibly courageous. Uh, and he knew how to talk to his men. He, he, he was like Colonel Kilgore from Apocalypse Now, only not as absurd. You know, he had that sort of light around him. You know, you, you, he, you could look at him and know that 
his guys were going to, you know, they were going to charge machine gun nests for him. Um, he had that ability to inspire confidence and he loved the men around him. He absolutely did. Um, you know, but he wasn't, you know, he wasn't the, 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 the he didn't engage in the lunacy of, of the character I referenced, but yeah. he did have that sort of spirit. And, you know, I don't know that I would have been able to inspire that level of confidence. And, and now that said, I've worked around some bad officers, quite frankly, you know, I, I'd had some leaders in, in my Marine Corps career who were not that encouraging or, or they were not uh, inspiring at all. In fact, they were somewhat divisive and, and petty and, those people exist too in the military. Um, they are not all, all uh, you know, they're not all professional all the time. And, you know, I, I didn't want to be like that. I, I knew that I wouldn't be, but at the same time, I, I don't think that I would have been comfortable ordering guys into places that would get them killed, mm-hmm. um, especially at 25, you know, which is when I saw rebel six do it. And, you know, I, I, I admire the amount of effort and energy that goes into getting that becoming uh, that becoming a battalion commander it takes an incredible amount of dedication. It also takes an incredible amount of, you know, both interpersonal skills, but also, you know, technical acumen. Um, and I, 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 I respect that to this day. Um, so I don't know. I don't know that. I don't, I don't know if I would have filled that role as well. I think I would have, if I had been a little older and gone into the military, perhaps in my late twenties and, and, and adapted and, 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 and gone into the, gone into it with maybe a little bit more emotional maturity than I had in my early twenties or my teens, I think I'd have done a better job in that role. Mm-hmm. Um, but as a younger, as a younger man, I don't, I just, I don't think I was qualified. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to remind folks who are watching, if you have a question, you can go down to the Q and a, button at the bottom of the screen and type your question in. And if you do make sure you mention your name and the name of your home independent bookstore, and we've only got a few minutes left, I'll ask Jared your question um, if we can get them in at the end, but I've got a couple of more questions um, myself. Uh, And, you know, this is, this may be something tough to talk about, but there's a a part in the memoir uh, in the book where you say um, there's a moment where you're thinking about what, these y'all do for each other and what you are willing to do for each other and the reasons that you do it. And you have this moment of clarity and um, it's on page 234. I don't have the, have the page pulled up right now, but you have this moment of clarity that you understand that if, if, if one of your men dies, you will kill for them. And if, if that happens to you, then, then your men will kill for you. And it's this, there's this circularity to it. And it seems like a moment that gives you pause, that gives you um, clarity. I, I don't know if clarity is the right word, but also like um, a certainty in, in a way as well. Can you talk about that? It, 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 I love that, that. That I was really proud of that particular sort of paragraph. Uh, it's beautifully of, written. It's, it, um, it's uh, beautifully written. It, you know, it's, it was talking about sending Ken off to war. Uh, there's a buddy of mine who, who was going off to do similar work. And um, yeah, it, there, there was this sort of circular nature to it. You, you, you hit it right on the head. And, it, and I'm glad because it means that I got my point across. Is that, <laughs> um, there is, there was this sort of cyclical aspect of it that I found kind of a little maddening in a way. I, it felt like it needed an interrupt. You know, like it needed something to just kind of like trip that wheel a little bit. You know, I don't know if I was courageous enough to be that guy, you know, like and 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 because that's what that takes. It takes it takes courage to stop an activity. It's easier to just kind of go along with one. And 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 I, I, I think a lot about that one. And I and it's like we, we, we sort of if you if you some veterans do this, I think what they'll do is they'll just kind of maintain an ire over the people who shot at them. You know, you saw, and, and some of it's deserved. I mean, uh, they experience something very traumatic and they watch their friends be killed by it and it makes them angry and, and it's an anger that, that, that eats at them. I mean, a great example of that is Marines, uh, Marine veterans from World War II. I mean, there are, there are folks in that, in, that, in that class, if you will, who went on their deathbed, wouldn't buy a Japanese product. You know, they, 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 wouldn't, they, they wouldn't buy a Honda to save their life they wouldn't they had very very 
quite frankly, sad and deleterious positions about the Japanese going well into their life because of the things they experienced in the moment. And part of that is because of this sort of, you know, I saw my friends die, therefore I am going to carry this grudge and I am going to, you know, put myself on the line for that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I have struggles with that. I think that, that there's, I think it's, it's, I don't know how helpful it is. I don't know how helpful it is in, 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 in stopping conflict. You know, I don't, I think that it, it can be a, it can be a toxic poison and it can be a poison rather, you know, not to be redundant, but uh, it can be a poison on the soul, I think. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was seeing a little bit. Like, look, you know, my, I was terrified my friend was going to get killed and you know, the, the odds were in his favor that he would come home, but, those thoughts are always going are always in the back of your mind and it's an ugly thought. And I knew that even his, his death would only propel me to go forward faster. If I could, you know, I, I, you know, it, it wouldn't sway me away. It would just, it would yeah. just, I would need to justify his death somehow. You know, I would need to, I would need to go and experience something similar to understand what it was he saw. Um, and maybe, and quite frankly, to issue a retribution if possible. Um, you know, which is not a very healthy thing to do. It's not a, it's, it's a terrible thing to do. It's a, you don't want to go into war with the idea of retribution. That's, that's a terrible place to start war. And that's basically nine 11, quite frankly. Sure. And yeah. That's, that's what a lot of those wars were is, is we are mad and we're going to go and we're going to bomb this place into dust on the premise of our anger or on the basis of our anger. And I don't, think that's a way to fight a war it's 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 anti-intellectual and you need some intellectualism in war in order to be successful at it and and also to avoid it mm -hmm. well said that's interesting that's one that's really well said um there's a moment um when you're in iraq and you ask the question what are we searching for in this war and when i think about that question i think about the title of the book you know uh, the, the, the the subtitle of the book the forever war growing up in the forever war and, you know, what only, not only what are, were we searching for in Iraq, but what did we spend so much time searching for in Afghanistan? And then also on a personal level with you, what were you searching for in the forever war in which you grew up, whether it be stories that you hear from your parents and Alan or what the, the film's platoon that you saw on television? Um, what is it that we are searching for when we go to war? I think in the context of the forever war, I, 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 I feel like we're searching for the last remains of our security that we had known it to be. You know, I, I, I feel like Iraq and Afghanistan were us trying to justify a way of life for ourselves in a world that was rapidly changing. You know, we had meddled in, 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 in Middle Eastern governments and South, South American governments and governments across the world in one form or another. And, you know, some with some to a positive effect, if you will, and a lot to negative. And while I think that the, 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 the Islamic Jihad against the United States was probably not built on the firmest moral ground, um, it was an indicator. It was a symptom of things. And it was a symptom of our reach and how much our reach was having an impact, having a deleterious impact in other parts of the world. And I think that our response to that after 9-11 Part of it was obviously the, retrib the retribution that I mentioned earlier, but I think part of it also was trying to grab onto a piece of security through the 80s and 90s that we had so kind of gotten used to or, mm -hmm. or, or sort of, uh, you know, understood our world to be. We didn't have to deal with these things. I mean, the, you know, the, the, bombing in, the, the bombing of the World Trade Center in 1993 was kind of a blip on the radar, it was, yeah. it was, but it, it, it wasn't enough to, to really hit the zeitgeist in the way that 9-11 was. Um, it wasn't earth shaking, no pun intended. Um, and um, for myself, I, I, I chased war to a degree. You know, I, I, really, I really wanted to experience it. And I put myself into positions that would allow me, allow that to happen. And sometimes it did and sometimes it didn't. Um, but I wanted to understand why I wanted to do this. Like it was so un in, in the larger landscape of our country. It's not an it's not a usual pursuit. <laughs> it is a it is an unusual one. And mm -hmm. but I wasn't alone. You know, there were people who were pursuing it as well. You know, I, I I met a Marine once. You know, before I went to Iraq, who was lamenting over the fact that he would not get to go. He was getting discharged on a medic for medical reason, 
and he was very bitter. Wow. He, you know, he missed his chance to fight in the war, you know, and, and, you know, if you backed up to Vietnam, that guy would have been, you know, doing, you know, veritable somersaults because he didn't have to go to Vietnam. Yeah. But this guy was upset. You know, he, he was lamenting the fact that he wasn't going to go. And I saw a lot of other folks like that. Part of that is just, you know, being part of that team and, and, and you know, being supportive of, of the people that are left and right of you who are going. But also some of it's very personal. And, and I, it's, it's, it, it goes beyond the service. And I think that that's something that I was trying to find. I was trying to find that answer to that question. And I'm not quite certain I have yet. And I'm okay with that. Yeah. Um, I think that that gives me something to chase after a little bit, to be frank. Sure, sure. Well, we are uh, up against our time, Jared. This has been a fascinating discussion hearing from you. And the book is wonderful. Everyone should check it out. It's a beautifully rendered portrait of coming of age uh, in, in a forever war. And I really appreciate you spending so much time with us. Thanks. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that we're here. You know, um, this has been a lot of fun. And, you know, uh, if you guys could go to an independent bookstore, you know, please do that. Yeah, you bet, man. Thanks so much. Good night, everybody. All right, take care.